The Verdict, a sidebar production, hosted by Kent Myers and Mick Cornett. As a part of its traditional and continuing commitment to public and community service, Crow and Dunleavy sponsors The Verdict. Also sponsored by Delta Dental, Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, and C.H. Guernsey and Company. Each week on The Verdict, we present an objective discussion of contemporary and legal issues, topical issues that will affect Oklahomans in their daily lives. The Verdict, a sidebar production. And welcome to The Verdict. Thanks for joining us. We're back to discuss legal, social, and political issues that are important to Oklahomans. Mick Cornett, as always, with one of Oklahoma's top legal experts, Kent Myers, and we're back to look at an issue that we started last week on judges and whether or not the appointment system is better than the elected system or some sort of common sense in between situation. Yes, we uh, focused uh, last week on both the appellate court judges, which are principally appointed and then run on a retention ballot, and the trial judges. Uh, this week we're going to uh, spend most of our time uh, highlighting the trial judge dilemma. The trial judge has got to run for election in Oklahoma, maybe with or without a, an opponent, mm -hmm. but nevertheless has to be elected on a nonpartisan ballot. In other words, the judge does not run as a Republican or a Democrat, the judge just runs as the judge, and then an opponent uh, runs against them, one or more. We have 150 such elections. Uh, this year, uh, our voters and our viewers will be seeing 28 contested elections. Now, on this show, we want to focus on what issues of judicial integri integrity are raised when a judge has to raise money, has to solicit campaign contributions from, from lawyers that appear before the judge, perhaps from uh, litigants that may end up appearing before the judge. And uh, what, what effect does that have on the judge? What effect does that have on the lawyer? I think another very important, very recent development has been a new United States Supreme Court case called the Kelly case that has basically taken the muzzle off uh, judges or candidates running for judicial office. In the past, they could not say as much as other political candidates could say in fact got disciplined for doing it if they if they did say a lot now that's gone they can say whatever they want to it will be interesting to see how that affects this this year's elections all right we'll beat our guests when we return you're watching the verdict with mick cornett and kent myers the journal record is pleased to be a sponsor of the verdict the journal record since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. The Verdict is pleased to have as a sponsor C.H. Guernsey and Company, providing architectural and engineering services to clients throughout the U.S. and around the world. For Crow and Dunleavy, I've both given and received. I've given my daughter an associate, and I've also received Crow and Dunleavy legal services. I think Carrie's a pretty capable person, and the legal services I received have been first rate. But what most impresses me about Crow and Dunleavy is its long-term commitment to the state and to the community. Service is everything to the law firm, a full-service firm of outstanding, integrity-filled people. Happy birthday, Crow and Dunleavy. Have another 100 years of great success. I want to congratulate Crow Dunleavy not just for reaching this wonderful milestone of its 100th anniversary, but for establishing during that 100 years the highest standards of integrity and, pe and professionalism and dedicated public service that's really set the mold and set the standard for law practitioners throughout the state of Oklahoma and throughout the nation. American Express Tax and Business Services. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. American Express Tax and Business Services. In Oklahoma City, the phone number is 405-843-5311.
And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers is going to introduce our guests. We're pleased to welcome back Burke Bailey to the show. Burke uh, is a, a longtime trial lawyer, and I would say, without uh, fear of successful contradiction, that Burke is one of the three best trial lawyers in the state of Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. Just don't ask me who the other two are. <laughs> uh, he's a guy that, that is best introduced by honors always. He's had honors in every school that he's ever attended, everything he's ever tried to do. He's been among the best at it, and uh, he certainly is, is uh, uh, a welcome guest to this show, member of the Oklahoma Judicial Nominating Commission. Uh, Burke, welcome back. Thank you, Ken. On my right, Honorable Niles Jackson, the United States Bankruptcy Judge for the Western District of Oklahoma, uh, just appointed for a 14-year term, uh, a longtime state court judge, uh, with a very uh, interesting background in the media, in the Peace Corps, in uh, a number of different uh, areas of our society before becoming a judge. Brings a wealth of experience and wisdom to the bench and was a member of the uh, Legislative Task Force on Judicial Selection in 1999. Welcome back to the verdict. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. We're glad to have you. Gonna talk about a little more naughty issues, uh, K-N-O-T-T-Y issues uh, <laughs> this time uh, than we did last week, last show. Let me just ask you, Burke, straight up, uh, is running for office consistent with judicial integrity? Well, I don't know that I would say it's not consistent with judicial integrity, but running for office certainly, uh, you, you're speaking running for office for judicial office. For judicial office. Yeah, for yeah. judicial office. For a district judge position in Oklahoma. Yeah. It, it, it certainly uh, has about it some very, very grave concerns, in my judgment. Such as? Well, uh, essentially, the only constituency a judge has to raise money from are lawyers. And that's essentially the truth. And I, 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 just to state that proposition is to demonstrate the difficulty, mm -hmm. because those are lawyers that uh, are either uh, uh, perceived as uh, as contributing to to uh, curry favor, uh, and certainly it must compromise to some extent, albeit that's dependent upon the individual. Uh, somewhat that the, the judge's uh, re response and reaction to to those lawyers when they come before him uh, for decision in matters of the most grave importance. So it's a problem. What do you think, Judge Jackson? You've actually run for election uh, in, an, in a contested election. Mm -hmm. uh, and actually had to get money. And, and you're right, it comes mostly from lawyers. Try to get money from the grocer down the street, and he'll give you $5. <laughs> yeah. And you have a budget of, in Oklahoma County upwards of $100,000 to run for election. Uh, now, the legislature has raised the rate now. One person can give $5,000. It used to be $1,000, which is far better. But now $5,000 from one person, when, when that's your whole budget may be $100,000, is a big amount. Uh, it's, it's difficult in that the, the judge has a committee who raises money. The judge cannot raise the money. But the judge has to sign off on the ethics reports that report the money. So the judge really has to know who's contributing. So you really got to balance these two. And do you tell these parties who came in, well, he gave me $1,000 and you gave me $100, but I can be fair. Well, how about the guy who gave you $100? How does his client feel about it? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, a tough, it's a tough decision. Well, let me raise another issue. We see in this time of uh, the primary election and the general election coming on, advertisements with the picture of the judge and a list of names of lawyers just getting longer and longer and longer, mm -hmm. the type getting smaller and smaller to accommodate all <laughs> the names of lawyers that support that judge. Uh, what do you do, Burke, as a practicing lawyer if a judge that you really have some significant concern with, perhaps, I'm not suggesting this has ever happened, but just if it did hypothetically, and they ask to put your name on the ad, what kind of problem does that give you? Uh, it's uh, it, it's similar to the problem we've just been discussing mm -hmm. about money. I mean, it's it's uh, it's it, it it it's different in degree, but I'm not certain that it's terribly different in kind. Uh, I have uh, um, found that my name is sometimes on lists that I don't recall ever being asked to approve, <laughs> uh, uh, and uh, there are there have been a few occasions when uh, I thought it best uh, not to uh, lend my name to someone's uh, uh, promotion in that regard. Uh, 
Uh, and but, I will uh, say the judge must separate himself from that. I also mm -hmm. had those lists, but that was to scare away other candidates not to file against me. But mm -hmm. I never ask a lawyer to sign it. I would always have my campaign chairman send out letters to law firms with sign-up lists. So I never knew mm -hmm. if someone was asked to sign and did not sign. I will have to tell you both that in a, in a judge that sat while, when Burke and I have since we have both been practicing and, and Burke and I both appeared in his court from time to time. I happen to know as a fact, I will not name the judge, but I know as a fact that when you, when you stood up to enter your appearance, the judge had at, at uh, his or her uh, right hand their campaign contribution list. And they would get your name and, then, and, and look to see if you were on it. Now that does mm. not give a lawyer a, a real sense of confidence that they're in there for an impartial hearing when that occurs. What are you sort of I, take I on agree. that? I that agree. That, that, that's almost laughable if it weren't true. And right now the contributions are, you have to file them with the Ethics Commission. They are online. Anybody can look up and see who has contributed to a judge's campaign and how much they have contributed. Now the judge, as I mentioned, should really not know, should not be swayed. But we had a case recently where a judge, uh, it was, he accepted $5,000 from a lawyer and five thousand dollars from the lawyer's father and he stayed in the case even though he was asked to disqualify himself and the Supreme Court said that was wrong the judge should have disqualified himself so at least now we have somewhat of a bright line on when to get out just in the time we have remaining what do you do uh, if, if uh, both the incumbent and the uh, opponent ask for money well, I'm in the happy position on the Judicial Nominating Commission of being able to say that we have a policy where we're disallowed to, uh, from contributing <laughs> to those judicial campaigns. But aside from that, uh, it is, I think, quite, quite customary, quite common for a lawyer to contribute something to both of those candidates, mm -hmm. uh, much as uh, happens in the political arena generally, yes. where many people contribute to both candidates. Just uh, uh, hedging their bet, so but to speak. Typically, connection isn't quite as close. That's very true. Let me jump in and get us to our first break. We're discussing judges and whether or not they should be elected and what happens if they are elected. We'll be right back. We are C.H. Guernsey & Company. We provide engineering, architecture, and consulting services to clients across the nation and around the world. Our corporate headquarters are located in Oklahoma City, and we have branch offices across the country, including Tulsa. We have provided quality service to clients for nearly 75 years. At Guernsey, we believe in quality work and unconditional client satisfaction. To learn more about C.H. Guernsey & Company, log on to our website at chguernsey.com. St. Gregory's University has been changing the lives of people like me for 125 years. Affordable, private Catholic education, balanced with dedication to community and service, makes St. Gregory special. We're extremely proud of our students' outstanding academic achievements and our nationally ranked athletic teams. It's when you help a student build a future of balance, integrity, and service that you change a life forever. St. Gregory's, a community for life. All children deserve a life of hope and love, but sometimes they experience a life of pain, neglect, and abuse. When that happens, each child deserves all of the quality assistance and representation that can be offered in our legal system. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children has over 350 of the best attorneys and volunteers in Oklahoma County who donate their time and services to represent children. For more information, call 405-23-CHILD. Oklahoma Lawyers for Children, helping to bring hope and love back to the lives of abused children. Welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. We're discussing judges and the electing process. Yes, we've uh, just finished discussing campaign contributions. Now let's talk about political speeches. Uh, in the past, until actually June 27th of this year, 
the uh, idea was that judges could not say as much in running for office as other political candidates did. I mean there were subjects they couldn't touch upon? They, they were not supposed to be touching upon subjects that might come before them mm. as, they're, as uh, when they sit on the bench. For instance, a judge uh, under the old rules used to, I mean I'm just using this as an example, should not say I'm against uh, capital punishment, I'm for capital punishment because that judge may very well deal with a capital punishment case and shouldn't have already taken a position on it uh, in advance in order to sway the electorate. On the other hand, uh, many would argue that the electorate has a right to know about how a judge uh, intends to, uh, what a judge thinks, how a judge intends to vote or, or lean. Uh, well, that's been pretty well put to rest with the Kelly case out of the United States Supreme Court. Justice Scalia wrote an opinion in the Kelly case disallowing a Minnesota rule very similar to one we have in Oklahoma, which we'll look at in a minute, uh, saying that uh, judges are just like other political candidates and to muzzle them violates the First Amendment. Let me call up a graphic. It is actually from the concurring opinion by Kennedy, but it sets forth the uh, the majority's opinion pretty well. It says, the political speech of candidates is at the heart of the First Amendment, and direct restrictions on the content of candidate speech are simply beyond the power of government to regulate. Uh, that's basically the majority's opinion. Now let's call up another graphic uh, from the dissenting opinion of Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. She says, judges are not politicians. And the First Amendment does not require that they be treated as politicians simply because they are chosen by popular vote. Well, that kind of frames the issue. Gentlemen, uh, just, uh, Judge uh, Jackson, how do you come down on that? I agree with the, my, with the minority opinion on this. I think if you have judges who are supposed to be impartial, who are not supposed to represent a constituency other than the law of the land, if you back them into a corner during a campaign by, by pledging, to pr by promising to do something, then how can they be impartial when that issue comes before them? Hmm. Uh, it's not going to happen, or if it's going to happen, it's going to be very reluctantly on the part of the judge. Bert, what do you think? My heart is with uh, Judge Jackson's uh, point of view there. But as long as judges are made part of the political process, by the law of the state, it's difficult for me to uh, parse the First Amendment in a way that wouldn't reach a judicial race as it reaches any other political race. So the solution, it seems to me, because the point Judge Jackson made is absolutely 100% valid in my opinion, uh, the, the, the solution is to find some way to, to, to secure judges without submitting them to the political process. Well, let's look uh, at another graphic now. Uh, Secretary of State Mike Hunter, a local person, not a judge, but uh, a, re a Republican uh, lawyer, uh, Secretary of State, uh, wrote uh, a comment in the Daily Oklahoman on July 10th of this year, just a few days after the decision comes out, and as I mentioned, Judge Justice Scalia wrote the majority opinion. And uh, Secretary of State Hunter says, as much as it pains me to say it, I'm afraid Scalia and company blew this one. Maybe they were motivated by a belief that the judiciary has become so hopelessly politicized that it should be treated like politicians. If this is what they were thinking, I think they are wrong. Uh, does that surprise you? I'm, well, Mike Hunter is a lawyer first before he's a politician, and I think he wants judges who will be as impartial as possible. And you're not going to get that if you back the judge into a corner during an election. A judge is different from a senator or a representative. You vote for them because they stand for certain things. They will vote the way you want them to vote for or against abortion, for or against campaign contributions. A judge cannot be that. A judge has to be in the middle on issues. Look at the evidence because every case is different. Because you have one capital case does not mean it's the same as the next one that comes before you. And you've got to be able to weigh the facts, weigh the law, and come down where you think 
justice should be. Well, see, I agree. Submitting a, a, a legislator to a popular vote is, is ideal because a legislature's job, a legislator's job, is to be popular. That's not the job of a judge. A judge sometimes has to make decisions that are very unpopular. But the well, judge is there to, to impose the law. Let me get you both now to make a prediction to the extent you can. Uh, if we now have the gloves off, on political speech in judicial races, what are we likely to see? Such such things as I'll fight for the rights of victims, uh, Judge X is soft on crime, uh, Judge Y is in the pocket of big business, Judge Z is bought off by the trial lawyers. Is this what we're going to see? I think you're going to see judges taking the pulse of the electorate. And if they see the electorate is for being tough on crime, then boy, that's what the judge is going to say. I'm going to be tough on crime. Anybody who comes before me, I'm not going to give them a chance. They go to jail because that's how you win votes. And you're going to see that. And it's just wrong. It's terribly wrong. And if, if when, when put this hypothetical into the context of, of me being there with a person accused of, uh, of a crime, uh, what sense of comfort can I give my client that this judge who ran on that kind of platform, that he's going to lock them up and put them away, is going to be fair. He's going to listen to, to the evidence in a fair and objective way and deal fairly with these issues. There's no confidence uh, in, in, that, uh, in that format. And, and, and that erodes, I think, one of the most important pillars of our democracy. I think this might lead to another changing of how we appoint and elect judges. Yep. I think the underlying statement of Justice Scalia is, if the states are silly enough to elect judges, then we need to let them speak as politicians. I think what he is saying is, the best way is through the appointing process and not the election process. We're out of time. Brilliant show, gentlemen. I learned a lot. Thank you both for coming mm. on, Judge Jackson. Thank you. Burke Bailey. We'll be back with a few final thoughts when we return after this break. You're watching The Verdict with Mick Cornett and Kent Meyer. We're pleased today to have as our guest Lisa McAllister. Lisa is a secretary in the Oklahoma City office and has been with the firm of Crow and Dunleavy for nine years. Lisa, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you, Ken. We uh, have asked you here today because of your activities with the Race for the Cure. Tell our viewers just briefly what is the Race for the Cure and why is there a Race for the Cure? Well, the Race for the Cure was founded in 1982. It's called the Susan G. Komen Race for the Cure. Susan G. Komen is a woman that lost her life to breast cancer at the age of 36. Her sister Nancy Branker started the foundation. And it raises money for cancer research, I take it? That's correct, for breast cancer research, screening, education. Well, now, uh, you've been with the firm for a number of years. How did you get involved with Race for the Cure? Ken, I'm a breast cancer survivor of a little over four years, and that's how I became involved with the Race for the Cure. I thought it was important to give back because I've been so fortunate. Well, what did you do uh, to support Race for the Cure, uh, particularly within the firm? What I do within the firm is I coordinate putting together the Crow and Dunleavy race team and assigning up our participants and collecting money from sponsors around the firm to help. What size race team did the Oklahoma City office of the Crow and Dunleavy enter this year? Well, we had over 50 Crow and Dunleavy participants runners? As our, on our team, runners on our team. And raised substantial sums of money, I suppose. That's correct. Uh, how does that 50 or 50 plus numbers compare with what uh, the firm has done in the past? We do, uh, this year was our biggest team, and every year our team just seems to grow and grow. And you're kind of in charge of getting that done? That's correct. Well, uh, just in the few seconds we have remaining, why is it, Lisa, that uh, Race for the Cure is important? What would you like our viewers to know about that? Well, when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, it's important that she not walk alone. It takes a team effort to raise the funds, to um, 
put towards research, screening, testing, and just community awareness of breast cancer. Lisa, thank you so much for talking about Race for the Cure. We're really pleased to have you. Thank you. Thank you for having me. We're back to wrap up another edition of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Kent Myers. And uh, Kent, I imagine there's some lawyers and judges out there with some great stories that the general public may never hear. Well, and let's hope that remains that, <laughs> that way, it stays that way. Uh, yes, uh, it's a, a very difficult system for the judges, a very difficult system for the lawyers, and a system that doesn't give the public mm -hmm. uh, much information. It's very uh, tough on the average citizen to know which judge is worthy of their vote. Uh, one thing that uh, uh, Judge Jackson said in the prior segment that I want to follow up on, he, he implied that it was the state's problem that creates the uh, elective system to have to deal with this kind of thing like uh, raw you political mean state speech. constitution? Uh, it, whatever state uh, system is used okay. to come up with the elective process. Uh, Justice O'Connor, in the Kelly case that we were just talking about that mm -hmm. took the muzzle off, the judges said, while voting for the majority, said this, if a state has a problem with judicial impartiality, it is largely one the state has brought upon itself by continuing the practice of popularly electing justice, mm -hmm. judges and justices. Uh, so it is, it is a problem that is self-imposed. If we insist on electing judges, mm -hmm. we've got to live with this, with the, this kind of problem. Uh, well, our viewers know that, like it or not, they're going to be electing approximately 150 trial judges, uh, either through the primary uh, por uh, portion of the election process or the general election, and they're going to be seeing some political debates and some political talk that may uh, at times seem unseemly, but uh, people want to get into these offices and they'll do a lot to get there. Just enough time to remind you about our website, theverdict.tv. We'll see you next week. Network.